How's everyone doing? Holding up okay? Yeah, how are your sandwiches? You had like six minutes to eat them? They're awesome. Shall we? Yeah, let's begin. Uh, my name is Harun Mughal. Uh, welcome to whatever panel it is I'm moderating. Uh, not really sure what the topic is, but you will know. Uh, whether or not we hew to the subject or not ultimately is something you can't control. Uh, they gave me the microphone, so it's their problem now. Uh, I have with me an outstanding lineup. We have Alana Newhouse uh, of Tablet Magazine, Wajahat Ali of whatever it is he's doing right now. Pakistan. Of what? Of Pakistan. Of Pakistan. And we have Gary Rosenblatt, who I think has been spying on MLI all this time. <laughs> he didn't say no. He didn't, yeah, he just nodded. Uh, it's a new America. So you have everyone's bios and their outstanding bios uh, in the program packet, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. Uh, we're going to have a conversation uh, where I play the role of a moderator and a panelist, uh, which is a bipolarity I actually am very sympathetic to uh, because it makes me a moderator Muslim, which is supposed to be a joke. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm also Hartman's staff, so that's a little bit weird. Like, I'm not really sure whose side I'm on in this conference. Uh, and if things turn ugly, uh, I will be like uh, an American Muslim in the age of Trump. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Am I American? Am I Muslim? I have no idea where anything happens. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about this moment, which I think uh, is a particularly important conversation, precisely because we seem to be faced with two opposing forces. Uh, it seems demonstrably obvious to me that right now, uh, North American Muslim and Jewish communities uh, have ever more reason to talk to each other, work with one another, hear one another, uh, and learn to respect, admire, and, and grow with each other. And yet at the same time, we live in an environment of increasing polarization. Uh, an environment where people are almost forced to feel like they have to take sides and inhabit uh, spaces that are black and white. And so we have seen uh, in, in the run-up to uh, the, uh, the arrival of the Trump administration, uh, evidences of both approaches. We've seen a lot more evidence, such as, for example, this conference, of Muslim Jewish cooperation and dialogue. And we've also seen issues that have served as flashpoints, whether it's the Israel-Palestine peace process, uh, the candidacy of Keith Ellison as DNC chair, all these moments that seem to be pulling us in opposite directions. And the challenge we seem to have is that to get through these as communities, uh, we turn to our media. And yet we also live in an environment where people more and more process and digest media uh, that seems to be basically operating in isolation from other sources of media. So from the fake news phenomenon to social media silos. So to help me navigate these, uh, I'm going to ask each panelist a question. Uh, depending on their answer, uh, I will ignore their answers and ask them different questions. Uh, because I'm really wedded to the questions I wrote um, <laughs> on the back of this piece of paper, sitting on the PATH train, like totally not this morning, uh, as I asked myself what I was doing. So um, I wanted to start with Wajahat right now to ask the question that I think unfortunately has not yet been asked mm. um, at this conference, and it's kind of a shame it hasn't. Um, Wajahat, where are the moderate Muslims? Uh, we are the only moderate Muslims on earth right here on this panel. Uh, we are the circumcised unicorns of 1.7 billion people that Shalom Hartman had to find, scorch, like literally scour the earth, and they found Harun Mughal, uh, a self-destructive, masochistic Muslim Jew, Shalom Hartman, betrayer, not betrayer, interloper, who knows? He's confused, he's broken, like Which the programming doesn't friend. work, and I'm the one who's still barely holding on to my sanity. Uh, the rest of the moderate Muslims are being audited right now, just like uh, Trump's taxes, so you'll never see them. <laughs> this is it, it's all you get. Thank you, too soon, <laughs> too soon. <laughs> Too soon? My bad. I still have till January 20th. Uh, look, that is not the right question. The question that we should ask is why is that question still being asked in 2017 America when we have 4 million Muslim uh, Americans, neighbors and citizens, cab drivers and doctors, and we've been in this country for over 500 years with about a third of the slave trade that was brought over here forcibly against their will being Muslim. So our sweat, our blood, our stories, our narratives are embedded in the soil of this country. And yet fast forward, I've been living here, I was born and raised here, believe it or not. Because uh, <laughs> people always ask me, when did you come here? And I'm like, from the beginning, from the womb. But I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, I've been living you know, in America, born and raised in Bay Area, which is why I'm wearing jeans and not a tie, I apologize. Uh, 36 years, and I can literally, when I, when I go to Audiences like this, media audiences, whenever they ask me to be the token Muslim, the sole representative of 1.7 billion people and 1,400 years of civilization, where on the drop of a dime I have to be an expert in Islam and Quran and Hakim al and Bollywood and Salman Khan and Hamas and Hamas and Fatah and Fatwa, and like need to know my stuff on the drop of a dime, right? Uh, 
I always get, I can always imagine like the seven questions. Where are the moderate Muslims? How come Muslims haven't condemn, condemn, condemned terrorism? Uh, do you condemn terrorism? What do you think about Hamas? What do you think about Hezbollah? What do you think about Al Qaeda? What do you think about ISIS? We're out of time. Bye bye. <laughs> um, and so, like, literally, for me, like, it's almost like I'm an autopilot and I'm like, can they just throw me a curveball, ask me about like biryani recipe, just something. Uh, and it's an interesting time. Look, the reason I use, some people laugh, some people cry, I don't cry, so I laugh for catharsis, dark humor, Jews of all people should be able to empathize with me as we enter Trump's America. And I just want to mention this, being a Muslim in Trump's America, I think it's kind of fun, because it's like choose your own adventure. If you turn left, there might be a registry. If you turn right, you might be in the camps. And I just hope the camps have Wi-Fi and halal meat, because if they have Wi-Fi, it can make dark humor, guys. It's going to be dark humor all day. <laughs> But look, in all seriousness, the way the media plays in this is 2017 America, despite us being here for 500 years, for the last seven years when they do poll after poll, 60 to 64% of Americans say they don't know a Muslim. Let that sink in. Now, when you talk to those same Americans, you say, by the way, bro, I'm your friend. I'm a Muslim. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you're not that kind of Muslim. You guys feeling me so far? What they say they know about Muslims comes from, anyone take a guess? The media. Now we're living in an interesting situation where Gallup did a study in September. And in the 50 years that Gallup has been doing this study, right now in America, we're witnessing the lowest trust and favorability rating Americans have in the fourth estate, the media, 32%. It was at its highest recently during the Watergate scandals of the 70s. So right now, most Americans do not trust anyone on this panel. Right, And they want fairness, they want accuracy, they want balance, and they want truth. And yet Donald Trump says that CNN is fake news, but he'll take the word of Infowars and Breitbart, which actually does fake news. So forget about Muslim and Jewish media personality. A media personality is like kryptonite right now. Now, in this kryptonite field, try being a Muslim American. Awesome. And being a Muslim American, like many people of color, oftentimes we're not asked to be the protagonist of our own narratives. We're dealing with white supremacy that still exists, that creates a totally unequal playing field where a white mediator is often trusted to be the protagonist of our narratives. If I'm to tell you about what's happening in America or about Islam or about Muslims, he's too emotional. He's too biased. Mm -hmm. We can't trust him. What's his agenda? Oh, there's Bob. Let's get Bob, who once ate hummus and made out with a Lebanese girl. He'll know more. Uh, so no offense to hummus or Lebanese girls or Bob. Uh, and so it's an interesting situation. And the last thing I'll say is because Islamophobia was brought up, the American Sociological Review, a non-Muslim, non-Arab, did a study reviewing the discourse about Islam and Muslims of the past 10 years since, 15 years since 9-11. Came out around 2010. He said by 2008 and 2009, the leading mainstream discourse about Islam and Muslims was formulated and formed by the leading anti-Muslim bigots in America. Okay, so these talking points, which were once fringe talking points, where are the moderate Muslims? Barack Hussein Obama is a Muslim. Every single American Muslim organization is a front for the Muslim Brotherhood. Sharia is taking over America. Who has heard this? Fringe extremist memes became mainstream memes Thanks to the blogosphere, radio, I hate being a stereotype saying this, Fox News. Certain philanthropies, certain individuals like David Horowitz, Steve Emerson, Daniel Pipes, Frank Gaffney, who by the way is now advising Donald Trump, awesome. And 2012 elections and 2016 elections, nearly every Republican presidential <laughs> candidate took these fringe memes and used it quote verbatim as talking points to the point that Donald Trump exploded on the field last November after following a cue from Ben Carson's anti-Muslim comments, saw that Ben Carson actually got a huge spike in Facebook visitors, got 1.1 million do donation three days after he said the anti-Muslim comments, and had more grassroots support in his Cincinnati rally. So Donald Trump says what? Everyone remember his first 30-second ad? He attacked two points. He said the Mexican illegal immig immigrants are crossing the border except that the video they used was not of Mexicans, but of Moroccans, but whatever. Uh, yeah, but who needs yeah, details, nuances. Uh, and the second thing he says is permanent ban of Muslims. Then, which became 
temporary ban of Muslims, then which has become a Muslim registry, then which became Islam hates us. And Muslim, I think Yehuda was talking about this in the first, uh, first talk, and I'll, I'll end this briefly. Uh, sometimes in these communities, you see the most marginalized community being the pinata. And right now, American Muslims, and I've studied this, if you follow the media framing and the Islamophobia discourse, if you just take a DeLorean to 20th century America, don't go to Europe. If you see what they're saying about Muslims in America, they're a fifth column. They can't be trusted. They're a criminal element. They will outpopulate us. They're coming after our women. They want to impose their law. You guys, is this familiar? Replace Muslim with Catholic and Jews. Same thing that happened in American media and American policy in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. So we're in, in an interesting point right now where it's a remake and a repeat and tag Muslims are it. But the one good news is, and I'll pivot, is Barack Hussein Obama, who's Muslim, in his farewell address, sorry, secret's out. I waited eight years, guys, eight years. Uh, in his farewell address, if you notice in Chicago, the longest sustained applause that he received was when he said, we need to end the discrimination against Muslim Americans. And Keith Ellison, who we should talk about, is now the leading candidate to head the DNC. Ilhan Omar, a refugee, hijabi, black female from Som uh, Somalia, is the first elected Somali-American last month. And Miss Marvel, speaking about the power of media, is a Pakistani Muslim American fictional superheroine from New Jersey who is now part of the Avengers and has one of the best-selling graphic novels in America. So I'm not a pessimist. I have two kids. Uh, they're babies. They're very cute. And I'm not going to tell them that your legacy is you'll be a great victim. You'll suffer very well. They'll always hate you, and there's nothing you can do about it. What I'll tell them is in America, despite all these problems, everyone's gone through this before. Muslims are going through it with our unique challenges. I will demand that they throw down with the pen and become the protagonists of their own narrative. And inshallah, God willing, use Islamic and American values to not only defend our liberties, but to be a real Muslim and American and shelter those who are more marginalized than us and pick everyone else up. I'm done. So uh, I know for those of you who are on the WhatsApp group who are doing the Wajaha drinking game, uh, nobody really thought you would say circumcision and womb in the same opening statement. Um, but no, no, they actually okay. said you can't say circumcision. So if someone says I can't say something, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make a circumcision joke so, right off the bat. He did. He did. Sorry, um, guys. Womb was Sorry, children. Place. So Alana, um, you know, taking Wajahad's perspective, you know, he mentioned something that was very interesting. He mentioned the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s in America, um, the way in which you sort of have this victimization narrative. And the thing that occurs to me right now, and we've talked about this before, is, you know, among communities that are marginalized in different ways or have histories of marginalization, there are obviously issues that prevent them from working together, or understanding each other. And so, you know, there is an elephant in the room. Um, I think the actual elephant in the room is probably orange. Um, but... There's, you know, the elephant in this room um, is, is, is Israel-Palestine. Mm. And it seems like, you know, as long as we don't know how to talk about mm -hmm. the issues that really, I think, uh, activate some of our greatest fears and anxieties, um, we are going to be unable to cooperate on issues of common concern. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Um, I think that... <sighs> One of the things that I think is a problem in all these conversations is this idea that um, the goal is for all of us to agree, which actually is not the goal at all. In fact, it's decidedly should not be the goal. And in fact, if it helps, you should put a sign up that says agreement and actually make a big X through it so that you stay far away from even trying to get there. The idea for me um, in these conversations is to actually um, address the things that are the problem and the things that actually make each of us suspicious of the other person. It's not gonna help, I mean, and I, the analogy that I use is, you know, it doesn't really help if you're in, if you decide to go for marriage counseling, it doesn't help if the first six sessions you sit and you talk about all the things you love about each other. Because actually that's not why you're there. You're there because of all the things that annoy you about each other and that actually may break the relationship. So you gotta start with the hard stuff. And as soon as you actually start with the parts of it that make you uncomfortable, that you know you're avoiding, 
um, I think the sooner you earn people's respect and they understand these are my views. These are the views. This is what this is why um, Israel, not only Israel, but a specific kind of Israel or a specific uh, part of Israel is important to me. This is why Palestine is important to me. This is why I actually think that there shouldn't be a Palestine. This is why I think there shouldn't be an Israel. Say it because you feel it. And if you're confused, work on your confusion together. Um, to me, you know, one of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier was um, when I was starting out as a journalist, I um, covered, it was right after 9-11. And one of the things that I was um, told to cover were interfaith relations. So I went to actually a lot of uh, conversations about um, uh, Jews and Muslims. A lot of hummus. A lot of hummus. A lot of hummus. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I quickly realized was that actually, no offense to the people in this crowd, but actually the people in the crowd were not the problem. Mm. Um, if you came to an interfaith conversation, chances are you were open-minded enough to actually be part of an interfaith conversation. That part of what was interesting after 9-11 was the way in which those crowds were very small. And the groups of people that actually wanted to really learn were tiny. And to me, that's the big challenge. The big challenge is bringing these kinds of hard conversations to the parts of all of our communities that don't want to hear them. Because I know the parts of the Jewish community that doesn't want to hear this. You guys know the parts of your own community that don't want to hear stuff about Jews that actually might be good. Um, those are the parts of, the, of our communities that need to be at the table. Um, it's not to say that we all don't, it's just to say that we can't be alone. So Gary, uh, you know, I, I met Gary um, through MLI, the Muslim Leadership Initiative. If you don't know what that is, um, I don't know what you've been doing the last like five hours, um, but it's okay. It's on page three of your program. There's a letter uh, by Imam Abdullah, and, who's now telling me to move my microphone. Uh, we have a very open relationship. Um, uh, Imam Abdullah and Yossi Klein Halavi, uh, who is also an imam. Um, <laughs> but don't tell him that. If you tell him that, he's not going to sleep. Um, but I don't think he sleeps anyway. Yossi, we love you. There, you know, you mentioned when you attended MLI that it had a really profound influence on you, that you came to this gathering uh, in one of the secret spaces that we've reserved for these conversations and locations that we will never disclose. Um, Starbucks. And all, you know, <laughs> all 400 of us were there. Um, and you talked a little bit about, you know, the chasm that's opened up between Muslim and Jewish communities um, and, and how it felt to be there and see those conversations. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you process that as a journalist and as a participant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, first, um, I still want to find out what happened to Bob and the Lebanese girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, having, that, having we'll to come back to that. Gary. They're having Semitic babies. We'll, I gave you crumbs. It's up to you to we'll, follow we'll it. come back to that. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to take notes at a session that I'm part of. So um, if, if you see me writing, if I say anything interesting, I can stop and write it down. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that was in November 2015, a little over a year ago. And uh, I guess the effect it had on me was simply what we've been talking about here today. <laughs> and that is uh, when you, you know, when you actually engage in real conversation with other people and find out that they're a lot more like you uh, than you wanted to believe perhaps before. And, um, you, you know, you sort of leave your comfort zone a little bit. And, uh, I guess what struck me the most and what I ended up writing about was the fact that there is no sum game in, mm -hmm. in all of this, that uh, mm -hmm. you can be for a Jew, you can be a proud Jew, uh, a proud Zionist, and you can have serious conversation and fellowship with people who very much disagree with you, but is there's a certain respect. I'm not sure if you have to get to the very hard stuff right away. Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe you need to see what the commonalities are first, but um, but it's true that the the Muslim Jewish dialogue groups that I've you know and written about or um, and and seen is uh, they're all, they're all the good guys and um, but they get in trouble as soon as they get to the to the Israel Palestine uh, issues. So 
Um, not surprisingly, when I wrote about it, uh, the reaction in the Jewish community, and, and again, I think statistically, the majority of American Jews are liberal, and, um, and, and I think are most every Muslim Jewish initiative I can think of is, uh, is, is it often um, is supported by the Jewish community uh, in terms of resources also. And, um, but, but sure enough, I mean, the, the uh, impact I got in terms of mail from readers, uh, some were saying this is, this is very encouraging and I'm, I'm glad you, you know, opened us up to it. And well, it's also who tends to write letters to the editor, usually people who are not happy about whatever it is, they're, they're upset about something. So most of the mail was, it's time for you to leave your job and we need a, you know, we need somebody who's proud of uh, the Jewish community and, and supports Israel to, to take over. So um, but they would write that about if I wrote about conflicts within the Jewish community as well. So uh, I, th I, th I think it's only been bolstered in, in being part of some other MLI uh, discussions and particularly in talking during the presidential campaign and hearing from people talking about uh, their own families and you know, their kids being afraid to go to school, their wives being afraid to wear traditional uh, head uh, covering and you know go out in society and um, for that not to resonate with somebody in, who's Jewish and knows the experience of Jews in America and throughout history, um, it's pretty hard not to not to feel empathy for that. So I think the trick is how to how to navigate those uh, discussions and how to sort of bring uh, the rest of the community along. Can I, can I jump in real quick? Sure, and then I'll no, mm -hmm. you go. Yeah. I can promote male Muslim misogynist stereotypes. Stereotypes, awesome. go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here to be your token male Muslim misogynist stereotype. Uh, but speaking about how sometimes engaging with people who share uncomfortable views can illuminate certain basic rea realities you otherwise would not you know, think of. Uh, I met Gary at one of these MLI retreats because Imam Abdullah Antabli used myself and Haroon as the first halal guinea pigs. Uh, he says, hey, there's an idea called MLI. It might be crazy. It might get you killed. Want to go? And I said, sure. Uh, and so this was like four years yeah, ago. Abdullah told us nothing bad would happen. Yeah, he said, I assure you nothing bad would happen. Trust me. And then later on, he gets excommunicated. I get it. No, I'm just kidding. Things worked out fine. But I met Gary. And what people don't know about Gary, aside from being a Jewish American media institution in, him, in it of himself, is that he's actually a very funny guy and kind of wants to be a stand-up comedian. So if you want to get great stand-up jokes and one-liners from Gary after the conference, but specifically about humor and storytelling, it's so amazing to me that when we went to the first MLI in, in Jerusalem, I think it was the second day, Abdullah asked myself, Harun, and the late, great Tayyip Taylor of Aziza magazine. May, may Allah bless her and rest her soul. She was fantastic. He said, halal guinea pig, go forth and address all the Jewish scholars of Shalom Harma Institute. Talk about <laughs> Islam and Muslims in America and Islamophobia. Go forth. Don't fail us. Um, and I remember Harun and I, as you can clearly see, are very uh, immature for our age. And afterwards, we're talking about leading Jewish scholars at Shalom Harma Institute. And I wasn't offended at all. The first thing people said to me was the following. We didn't know Muslims could be funny. I wasn't offended because I could tell it was sincere. Second thing, when we thought your know, Muslim leaders, and I'm not a leader, uh, were coming to meet us, we thought you'd all be like Emma bin Ijab, and you guys are really good. The third thing, and I could tell, and this was veiled commentary, and I joke about this, it's not just a part of Jewish audiences, but American, American audiences, when they see Muslims, especially Muslim brown male with chest hair, they feel as if we've just evolved three days ago, that there's bruises on my knuckles. Amazed that I can be both eloquent, sometimes funny, humorous, and intelligent, right? And you could see like this shock. It's like, what? That was very, huh, insightful commentary. Two blocks from here, five years ago, I did a piece for Salon, a humorous commentary piece, where I did a, a, a play on the religious draft. And I said, Muslims will give away our like, toxic Muslims, will trade. Christians give us some of your people. Do you, you know, it was just like this parody on religious trade. Like we have to get rid of like some of our toxic community members. Like you take Mike Tyson, we'll take Seinfeld. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I, had, I had a really well-intentioned, 
Ivy League educated, literary agent, white guy, really nice guy, well-traveled, who just two blocks from me took me out because he wanted to you know, sign me. And he fed me grilled octopus for the first time, which was exquisite. And I was eating the grilled octopus and I didn't say a word. And he just kept, he looked at me and he just inspired this monologue. And he's like, you know, I was reading your article. And I'm like, wow, this is funny. Wow, it's a Muslim guy who wrote that. And I didn't think Muslim guys could be funny. Why did I think Muslim guys couldn't be funny? That's strange because you're human beings. But when I think of Muslims, I'm like, you think, <clears throat> he goes, yeah, yeah. Why did I think that? Damn, I shouldn't have thought that. And I want to give this essay to my, uh, my senior citizen mother who lives in the Midwest because she's a sweet lady who honestly just hasn't met your people. And I fear when she watches the TV, she'll get the wrong impression. Right. Meanwhile, this Ivy League educated individual had the same impression. And so never underestimate the power of what Gary was saying, what Alana was saying was that to get in those uncomfortable spaces and be your best authentic self and not engage in these vanilla hummus conversations. That's why I told Abdullah, it's the last thing I'll say, I speak too much. I said, if MLI is gonna be this vanilla, I like you, you like me, I like hummus, you like hummus, hooray, don't waste my time. You know, it's interesting because the, one of the first articles when I was doing the, when I was an interfaith, reporter on interfaith stuff, one of the first articles that I um, reported on was a piece by a, a professor at Harvard Divinity School about um, Abraham. It was really interesting. After 9-11, there, there were all of these interfaith conversations designed around Abraham, because Abraham is what we have in common, right? And of course, John Levinson points out very smartly that actually Abraham is the start of the conflict. Wow. Um, and, but he, his point was, that's right, he should be our mascot, mm -hmm. but not for the reasons that you think. Not mm -hmm. because actually he's a representative of what we have in common, but because he's a representative of the, of the beginning of the fight, mm -hmm. um, or of the beginning of hostility. And in fact, we should be doing these kinds of conversations. And you know, the only thing that I have to say that is just for a little bit of context, I mean, part of the problem with having any discussion about anything in the media, particularly controversial things, is it almost feels like we're looking at something under a microscope. We are looking at something right. We're analyzing it correctly, except the room around us is on fire. Mm. It's not that what we're saying about how Muslims, how Jews, how, how anything in the media is reported on is wrong. It's that the entire media infrastructure has completely collapsed. And so everything that gets done is getting done corrupted. Sensationalism. And it's not, it's, it's sensationalism about ethnicities, about religions, about whole people. It's sensationalism about the economy, about literally every industry, about our politics. It's not, we literally live in a time right now where everything is refracted the wrong way. So of, of course our stories are gonna be refracted the wrong way like everyone else's, right? Now our stories in some senses and your stories um, are getting refracted even more obscenely. Mm. Um, and, but I feel like we need to talk about how that works inside of a whole system that's broken. Um, um, how the mainstream media covers religion has right. always been um, uh, looking at the, at the most uh, exotic elements. Right, right, but I feel like how readers read and absorb the media has changed. And the truth is, is that when you don't pay for something, your relationship to it is different. You don't actually absorb it the same way. Um, I don't believe that the fact that everything on the internet is free has nothing to do with the conversation about right. Breitbart right. being just as worthy a platform as the New York Times or as CNN. Because actually people look on the internet and they can go everywhere. What's the difference? And well, Breitbart was more influential than New York Times, especially online and driving eyeballs when it came to the last election. I'll right. just let that sink in for a right. second. Right, and, and the point is, is that influence you know, our, right now, CNN and the New York Times can report everything the way that we all think would be great. And I don't know that it would make a whit of difference because the question isn't necessarily one about, I mean, it, uh, it's, it's good and important to correct our media and we have to. But my worry is that even if the media gets it right and when it gets it right, it doesn't have influence anymore. As, as little influence as we, think yeah. it has, um, you still have the President of the United States, if, uh, if you cut off, if, if we didn't report his tweets, 
uh, or boycotted a press conference uh, when he won't call on somebody because he's upset at their uh, organization or conflates CNN with BuzzFeed, um, he, you'd starve him of the oxygen he needs. So, I mean, I think whether it's uh, the prime minister of Israel who's making secret discussions about, uh, about his coverage, you know, with, uh, with the publisher of Yediot uh, or Trump, uh, in more obvious ways, um, they obviously do care about what the media says. Maybe we being in the media, we always th you know, think nobody pays attention, but I think we do. You're right that when we talk about fake news and uh, you have your truth and I have my truth and we can each decide, I think that's very worrisome. But I still think that authentic journalism is, can still play a really vital role. It has to. So Jahad, um, building off the idea of truth, um, I want to ask you a tough question. I hope no one here is offended. Um, and, and I want to ask uh, you both too, Alan and Gary. Um, we talk a lot with Jahad about you know, anti-Semitism, about reverse anti-Semitism, about the way in which Muslims responded to our participation in this program, right. like being in this space. Um, how do Muslims see Jews? Hmm. And exactly, right? That's, <laughs> I'm glad that you broke first. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's no way I'm going to answer that question uh, when it comes to me. Thank you, Harry. No, <laughs> no, no and, and, and I would like to know, like, yeah. what do you see right now? Like, what is what is the truth of this? Like, let's let's be raw sure. and real. Let's not sure. pretend like our communities are. You talked about how our community is seen in certain ways. Let's talk about how our community sees other communities. Perfectly fine. With um, and and <laughs> go to from there to like, is it changing? Like, is there? Are, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Uh, I force myself to be optimistic because my faith commands optimism. There is a great hadith, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that my friend, writer Willow Wilson, reminded me of, that even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. And it might seem that the four horsemen have orange skin and tiny fingers. Uh, <laughs> no offense to orange-skinned, tiny-fingered people. Some of my best friends <laughs> have orange skin and tiny uh, fingers. But like I said, I have kids. I take this seriously, I have two babies now, right? Which is crazy that universe gave me, like allowed me to reproduce, which is I find amusing. The surreal sense of humor of God. Uh, and you know, one's Ibrahim, mm -hmm. named 2.5, uh, he's 2.5 and two and a half. And then uh, the Nuseba is six months. Um, and so I'm deeply concerned about their future. Uh, and so because I'm concerned about their future as an American, as a Muslim, as the son of Pakistani immigrants, as a person who inhabits this earth, which is affected by climate change, despite what Scott Pruitt, the new head of EPA might say, Scott Pruitt, the head of EPA, wants to dismantle the EPA. Let the jokes write itself. Oh, it's reality, my God, let's not have a heart attack. Um, I cannot choose cynicism. And that means I also have to work twice as hard to clean the dirty laundry that exists within my communities. Uh, Muslim communities, American communities, and Pakistani communities, okay? When it comes to Muslims viewing Jews in America, believe it or not, American Muslims see Jewish Americans as the successful paradigm of the minority that made it. These guys were marginalized, these guys were hated, these guys weren't allowed. I went to law school, I'm a recovering attorney, I practice, still licensed. Uh, for those of you who remember, you might ask your fathers and grandfathers if you had a Jewish name or if you look Jewish, were they hired in law firms? No, right? So they were like outlawed and like, like gone to the wastelands of transactional law. And then lo and behold, in the 70s and 80s, mergers and acquisitions, karma. Uh, had to develop their own JCCs, right? Had to change their names. And so Muslim Americans, believe it or not, are not ignorant to the realities of the American Jewish experience when it comes to being the marginalized other. So when we see Mus uh, Jewish Americans, it's almost like this like reverence slash anti-Semitism without trying to be anti-Semitic, they're so successful. They have superpowers. They're magical. They're like, they're influential in Hollywood and they're influential in finance and they're influential in politics and they're influential in philanthropy. How do we become like them? And then with our own internalized self-loathing, we can never be as smart as Jews. They'll always be smarter than us. They'll be two steps ahead of us. If you want me to be really raw and honest, American Muslims want to emulate the Jewish path of success towards mainstreaming in America while still not giving up our cultural and identity, which 
some of us have seen Jewish Americans do, right? Like not all of us want to be Seinfeld, purely secular. Does that make sense? At the same time, there is a consensus. I think this is fair. Many American Muslims think that any time an American Muslim of prominence, whether in politics, whether a Debbie or Montessar, who you just spoke of, whether a media personality, whether Harun Mughal, you've had hit pieces, Abdullah has had hit pieces, I, mashallah, have had many hit pieces, there will always be a concentrated effort from some Jewish Americans to marginalize American Muslim ascent in America based on the zero-sum game of Israel-Palestine. Meaning, if American Muslims achieve success, that somehow automatically triggers a default response that this will undermine Israel's position and weaken American Jewry. Daniel Pipes said as much in the National Review like 15 years ago that any time you know, an American Muslim organization succeeds, I, as a Jewish American, feel threatened. And so for many American Muslims, they're like, you guys have made it, and yet we're trying to get to where you're trying to get to, and each time we see, I hate saying this, I did the research to follow the money, a Jewish footprint when it comes to Islamophobia keeping us down. Then you throw in the Israel-Palestine elephant, the zero-sum games, what Yehuda said, uh, and some other people said, this foot soldiering of our youth in college campuses. You will be a foot soldier in the MSA, you will be a foot soldier in the Hillel, this is the script, you're an actor, go perform. If you don't, you're excommunicated. And then you get litmus tests. And then you get the media back and forth, back and forth, polarization. And so this creates what I see, these silos and bubbles that we're witnessing now all across America, red state, blue state. You see silos within Muslim and Jewish spaces on Facebook. You don't believe me. Look what happens when a Gaza crisis happens. You will literally lose friends by simply posting an article. Yes? No? Yes. Um, and that's why I was telling Jewish Americans, and I, and I, you know, going back to the points that you guys were making, I've tried deliberately to go to the Midwest, Rust Belt, the South, and Jewish space in the past two years. Because I saw, I saw Trump, and I realized that he had Muslims first, he went after African Americans, he went after immigrants, he went after women. And I told the synagogue last year when they invited me to talk about Islamophobia, which I thought was a big deal, the first time they ever invited a guy like me, I said, who's gonna come next? They're like, who? Jews because that train is never late in America. Anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-Jew. And I said, we have to come together around these shared spaces where we don't always agree on stuff, but we have to come up with a better narrative, a dialogue and an etiquette to talk to one another, understand one another, where we can create a space that doesn't say hummus, yay, let's never touch Israel, Palestine, but you go right through Israel, Palestine, but in a way which there's etiquette and goodwill. And I'll say one thing to this, Right after the Gaza crisis, based on the relationships I developed with Yehuda, Yossi, Daniel Hartman, and others, Yehuda invited about 12 of us, Rabia was there, Abdullah was there, I think Harun was there, to his house in New York, where he shockingly made very tasty cake. Uh, it was like really good. Uh, we were all surprised. And coffee, and in his living room, right while Gaza was happening, okay, we had blunt conversations. I wish that was recorded and posted online because we were talking about Israel, Palestine, chosenness, uh, APAC, Muslims, like every third rail topic you can imagine was explored. And each of us said our piece without sacrificing our authenticity or our communities while drinking coffee and no one raised their voice and we all hugged and left at the end. That's the type of conversations we need in America. Real talk, no vanilla fluff, but in a way where our silos explode and we get our heads out of the cocoon. Alana, so I want to ask you um, the same question. How do you think uh, Jewish communities see American Muslims? Do you think there's truth to what Wajahat's saying? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously there's truth to what he's saying about the Muslim community. Um, the, here's the thing, though, that um, is true. In, it's just true about uh, Jews. Um, when Muslims, which I'm sure, and inshallah they will, follow the Jewish path toward ascension and aspiration and success, you will see that um, very, very soon, nobody will agree on anything, um, which is actually going to be the Jewish model for you. Um, there is, it's, yeah. a, it's a very old tradition and it's terrific. Join it. Um, you'll actually find yourself in rooms where you literally you cannot find a person to agree with. Um, I think that's very healthy, by the way. As a so Muslim, I... I, I 
honestly, as a Muslim, can I just say that? I, that's my hope for the American Muslim communities. Uh, and, the, and I was just saying this right before, right before this conference that it's amazing how Jewish American communities could come together and disagree. I wish American Muslims can model this level of engagement and disagreement. I just want to say that. I mean, don't model it exactly. Um, <laughs> with some tweaks, <laughs> right. with some tweaks. Um, anyway, um, here's the thing. Um, and I'm gonna paint in broad strokes because there's no other way to answer that question. The vast majority of American Jews consider themselves liberal. Um, they are not people who, I, I don't believe them to be, people who harbor um, deep Islamophobia in their hearts. In fact, they are the people who um, would willingly, happily come to any kind of conversation and actually be um, uh, terrific participants of them. Um, in, in part though, let's actually ignore those people. Even understanding that they're the majority, the vast majority of American Jews. Yeah. Um, then there are smaller groups of people, but those groups of people frequently get portrayed as, well, these are the Orthodox or these are the pro-Israel types. In fact, that, this, this idea that there are two different Jewish communities is itself, I think, a huge problem and a huge corruption. Mm -hmm. That there are the secular Jews who are liberal, who don't really care about Israel and don't really care about religion, and they're the majority. And then there's a small group of Jews who are religious and they care about Israel and they're right-wingers. Right? That is false. And in fact, if you go out and you meet people in the secular liberal group, you find that many of them actually care deeply about religion and many of them care about Israel. And if you go and you meet people who are technically orthodox and in the pro group, you realize that there are tons of so-called right-wing positions that they don't take at all. Right. Um, and in fact, they're incredibly nuanced. So this idea of these two communities is itself a problem. But to me, the issue is that what you want to do, in the Jewish community, I feel that frequently, and this is partly an internal problem, the people asking Jews to come to conversations about Muslims, there, some Jews have told me that they feel that the imperative is for them to check their authenticity for them not mm. to actually be authentically Jewish in order that they are coming as successful Americans, in some senses as successful white people with privilege, when in fact they may not feel that way. And they want to have a conversation with another minority. They want to have a conversation as people who feel attacked and mm. oppressed, particularly right now. Right. They don't want to have a conversation as the successful white people with no challenges. Right? who just can teach people stuff. They actually want to come on an even plane and that they feel that the spaces aren't, don't have that assumption involved. So to me, is there Islamophobia? Absolutely, there is. There's just, I mean, there's tons of, we all have tons of prejudices. Jews have them. The Israel-Palestine the Israel -Palestine issue um, clearly turns the dial up on it each time there's a flare up. Um, but the, for me, the much bigger challenge is creating spaces where the people involved, Muslims can come to the space without having to sign a waiver that they are officially a moderate Muslim. And where Jews can come to the I, space- I have it right here. You have it? Yeah, I know. You keep copies of it. Um, and where Jews can come to the space by saying, I'm an authentic Jew, and maybe even I'm a pro-Israel Jew, and maybe even I'm a pro-Netanyahu Jew, right? Actually make the space big and make this space big enough for people. And this is where I actually, um, I'm so happy that that conversation was not taped and put on the internet. Um, and I'll tell you why. I don't think it would have happened the same way. And in fact, I want to encourage people to listen to that line in Barack Obama's farewell speech. Stop talking to people on the internet. It is a toxic space for these conversations. These spaces are the spaces that are helpful. Um, talk to a human being and see their face and see their eyes and actually feel them in that space. It will make a world of difference. Yes. You will understand that they don't hate you because of how they're looking at you. And it's invaluable and you can't get it on the internet. Um, so to me, it's my long-winded way of saying, yes, each one of our communities has hatred for the other running through channels of it. Um, the question is, is how do we deal with it? And to me, I think that the only way to do it is conversations like this one. So.
So Gary, I'm going to I'm going to delete my previous question because I, I found what Alana had to say really fascinating. I do want to point out that we're supposed to end at 245, um, but we're just going to end at three because ending on time would be Islamophobic. Um, <laughs> so none of you want none of you want to do that, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so respect my culture and just go over 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you hate me. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, this is all going to go wrong. So um, Gary, you know, I want you to feel free to, to answer the, the question that I was going to ask you, which is the question I was I was posing to Alana. But I, I want to ask you something a little bit different. Um, today, when I, I got into an Uber uh, to go to the train station, and I could tell the driver was like looking at me and then looking away and looking at me and looking away. And he finally worked up the courage to say what he had to say. And he got really quiet and he said, do you know how many days until Donald Trump takes over? Oh. And I said, the end of the week. And then, you know, both he and I were just quiet. And you know, we heard the voice of God because um, it was, just, and he didn't say anything the rest of the ride. Like he's just trying to process what just happened. Um, but you know, Alana talked about the internet and about you know the toxicity of these conversations. And it's interesting that you know a slim margin of votes you know changed the outcome, perhaps for the world. Mm. And you know, Alana had mentioned CNN and 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 New York Times. She talked about the Times and, and Breitbart, which I had talked about this as well. Um, I feel like. Sometimes when we're talking about how to respond, maybe we don't realize what has just happened. Like we right here have become the internet trolls of this age. Like we're not the mainstream anymore, mm -hmm. arguably. Now it could be that, that this is a blip and that we go back to establishment mainstream, you know, for good, for good and bad. But if, if it is actually the case that everything is just flipped and the things that we as journalists have been taught to value, the, the, the achievements that have been built up over, over generations, of editorial responsibility, of fact checking, of of you know, of a of a subscriber model. All these things that we sort of had mm -hmm. are gone. Like, are we actually preparing for this moment in the wrong way? Like, do you think that we've actually grasped what's happening? <laughs> I don't think we'll know for a while. But uh, if you look at the positive, we talked about being optimists um, by, you know, genetically perhaps. Um, Donald Trump brought us here today. I mean, I heard this morning that this conference was planned the day after he won. Um, so maybe um, he will scare us into interacting together where until now we've been reluctant to do it. Muslims and Jews and other minorities as well. We look at, uh, you know, our freedoms are not as secure as they might have been, uh, you know, a year ago. And that can have a very positive effect as well, perhaps. But uh, look, when, when the, you know, the spokesperson for the president-elect says, um, don't pay attention to what he says, you know, think about his intentions in his heart. Um, it's hard for a journalist to respond. I mean, it's hard enough to do our job. Now we have to be cardiologists. It's, uh, so, I, um, <clears throat> you know, I think... There is no other way uh, for a journalist to respond other than to try and empower people by informing them. And um, I still think there's some truths out there that are not debatable or you know transactional. And um, I, I think there will be people who will say, "Well, this is a new ball game, and we have to adjust." And I'm not even sure what that means. Um, for journalists who have a, any integrity. And it doesn't mean we have to be adversarial all the time. It just means reporting what's going on. Um, the Jewish week where, where I work, we are now um, also publishing the New Jersey Jewish News. And uh, we've been writing about Baskin Ridge, the um, area in New Jersey where there was um, a mosque that was going to be built and there was discrimination. and. Uh, the Jewish community cooperated. It, I thought it was a it was a really positive story, um, but we got flack for um, for writing about these kinds of um, situations too much. Uh, so I think there's always that um, balance, and um, how much do you you know cater to your audience, and how much do you feel like you have to bring them along? It's always a balancing act, but I think it's important to do the kind of stories that we that we feel need to be done and are still authentic. Thank you. Um, so we have some time for questions. I think we have time for three questions, so we'll take them in a row. Uh, we have a microphone that will be coming around. Uh, I would ask a couple things. Uh, first is, 
Uh, you phrase your question in the form of a question. Uh, so Harun, do you use Rogan? The answer is no. Um, it's painful, but it's true. It's okay. Um, you know it's bad when you go on TV and they like put makeup on your skull. Like they're like, oh, it's the shine, and you're like, you start crying inside. Um, I'm I'm still crying. Um, so please do uh, you know enunciate your question carefully uh, because this event is being live streamed and the NSA is recording it. So it's important. Um, it really sucks to be hanging out with Muslims. Trust me. Um, so we have a question over there. I know. Um, Hi, my name is Rebecca. My family actually resembles Harun and um, and Wajat more than um, the other two panelists, but I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask about whether it's actually true, whether we see that um, the Israel-Palestine conflict is actually um, the sticking point, the only sticking point, the most relevant because my family comes from countries in the Middle East where Jews have been persecuted for millennia and have always been the minority and came here to escape that. And so there are real historical aspects, I think, to this that might have been omitted in what was said. So I just wanted to ask if there was a clarification to be made on that. As the token representative of 1.7 billion people mm -hmm. and 1,400 years of Islamic civilization, uh, I can tell you from the American Muslim perspective that the sticking point, the elephant in the room, is Israel-Palestine, which then gets very deliberately or unconsciously manipulated through religious and cultural language and lens to justify uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic rhetoric when you confront some Muslims and say, you know what, if you were to replace what you just said about Jews with Muslims, you would call that person an Islamophobe. And believe it or not, overwhelmingly, because my family's from Pakistan as well, and as you can see, there's probably not good pro-Israel literature coming out of Pakistan. <laughs> uh, when it comes to many practicing Muslims and who know their religion uh, and try to be religiously literate, they take deep offense if you say that you hate Jews. Because what they'll respond is this way, I don't hate Jews, they're people of the book. I have nothing against Jews or Judaism. It's only because of Israel, Israel and the oppression. But then, with some of them, not all of them, if you pay attention closely, this type of vague, wishy-washy, blanketing language where the nuance that Alana talked about, forget two tribes, it just becomes the Jew, mm -hmm. right? Jew, Israel, Netanyahu, Ariel Sharon morph together. But then you say, hey, hey, wait a minute. If you were to say the same thing about, you know, Muslims, someone would say Islam, probably, I, what? And that, that feeling of being aghast and offended is a sincere feeling in the sense that if you really said to them that you hate Jews and Judaism, then they'll say something like, no, 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 I'm just anti-Zionist. But speaking about religious language and not understanding how our words affect the other people because we don't interact, many American Muslims and some like even activists don't realize that when they say we're just anti-Zionist, how that affects the majority of American Jews. Many of them, not all of them, read that as you are anti-Jewish. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to gloss over uh, some of the horrible things that some caliphs in the Muslim civilizations did, not only towards Jews and Christians and Hindus and Muslims. That's there. Okay, it's there. I don't uh, applaud it. Uh, I don't sugarcoat it. I never have. Just like I don't sugarcoat the crimes of America and American foreign policy and domestic policy. I don't think we should either when Israelis do it or Jewish Americans do it or any other group does it, right? Like we're all, we all got a lot of sins and dirty laundry under our bed, right? But when it comes to the religious communities themselves, I can categorically tell you, if you go up to them and say, you hate Jews and Judaism, they will be deeply offended. Right. And they will say, no, it's just about Israeli occupation and oppression of Palestinians, which then of course gets used and abused very conveniently through religious cultural, political, and economic language. I try to be as upfront and sincere as possible in answering that question. Can I, I just want to jump on that really quickly. I think it's really important to understand North American Islam demographically to make this point. There is definitely a long history of Muslims persecuting, oppressing, sidelining, marginalizing uh, certain communities, right? There's a long history of Muslim misogyny and, and chauvinism. I mean, all this stuff exists and, and it needs to be talked about. But I think when it comes to Israel, Palestine, Muslim-Jewish relations, I would, I would say two things that are really important to understand. The role that 
Israel, Palestine specifically plays. Um, a majority of American Muslims are either South Asian or African American, probably about 60, 65%, something like that. Um, neither community inherits that particular history, right? So the majority of South Asians, so actually, and this actually blows a lot of people, the majority of Muslims in the world, their primary experience with the religious other is Hinduism and Buddhism, not Christianity and Judaism, right? Like most South Asians in South Asia will never interact with a Jewish person ever, right? Their primary exposure to Judaism is through Israel and Palestine, and that's what gets inherited. And, you know, there's a long history of problems in Muslim South Asian civilization, whatever you want to call it, but anti-Semitism was not one of them, principally because there was almost, there was very small Jewish communities and the way those, I mean, it was, there was a lot of anti-Hindu sentiment. There's a lot of anti-Christian practices happening right now. Um, but that wasn't there. And then in African-American communities, it's a completely different dynamic, given that you're not coming out of the same, obviously, historical trajectory. Um, so I do think the way in which our communities here end up talking about Israel-Palestine is very inflected by that narrative. Um, but I think we had to... But the, but the toxic part of this, and he's right, like right on point, my thumbs to Pakistan, is we unfortunately then adopt a certain zero-sum narrative that is handed down to us as quote-unquote fellow Muslims for people who are deeply invested in this. And also, one thing I'll say is the reason why so many Muslims are invested in Israel and Palestine is because of the deep religious connections that m many Muslims have towards Jerusalem, which many Jews don't know about. It was our first Qibla, like the first place where we used to pray. Uh, it's where Prophet Muhammad did the uh, Isra and Miraj, right, where he went up to heaven and then prayed below, like, behind, uh, he led the prophets. So for us, there's not just the historical uh, and political significance of, oh, fellow Palestinians, but also I think some Jews, I mean, I'll be, I was shocked that many Jews just don't know about the, the religious affinity that many Muslims have, which then gets very deliberately used and abused by people with political agendas and exported to Pakistan, to Burma, to wherever Muslims are, and they're unfortunately only framing of American Jewry, Judaism, and all the pluralism is unfortunately through the zero-sum game of Israel and Palestine. And what, and what surprised me is how many uh, American Muslims didn't realize that Jews had a connection to Israel and Jerusalem that preceded 1948. Right. Belonging. But I didn't want to take too much time. That's my <laughs> time. Take time. Um, unfortunately, Islamophobia is still a real thing. Um, so we're going to have to stop because this <laughs> colonial Western imposition of time is being rammed down our throats. I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. Please thank the panelists on my behalf. Yeah. You're a funny guy. Huh? You're a funny guy. You're a funny guy.